Hey guys, Greg here, Bone Tactical, and today I'm going to talk about PTSD. I'm going to tell you guys how I deal with my personal trauma that I've had in my life. I'm going to tell you guys about some of the gentlemen that I have done work with, either through Bone Tactical or through Warrior Adventures, Inc., the nonprofit organization I started specifically to help others with PTSD. I'm gonna tell you some stories. I'm gonna kind of define or explain what PTSD is in a simple way, what it means to me, and I'll kind of give you the bone tactical rundown of thinking of things outside the box like we do here, and hopefully give you some tips that will help everyone because these tips will help you if you have PTSD or they'll help you even if you don't because they'll help you help others and then know how to deal with others that have some sort of traumatic stress that they are dealing with in their lives. So you'll know how to deal with others and then you'll know how to deal with your own traumatic stress after watching this video. Now we can only speak from personal experience so let me tell you a little bit about my personal experience with post-traumatic stress. I'm going to start off by saying this is very personal to me. It's very difficult to talk about. It's something that I would not share publicly. In fact, I don't like sharing things publicly at all. I'm not the type of person that likes to speak out publicly. I do this because it's the right thing to do. I do this because I can help others. So, also, please give me some feedback and let me know this is helping you guys because this is the only reason I'm doing this, but I'm doing it because it's the right thing to do. I personally have dealt with a lot of trauma in my life. I was first incarcerated at the age of 15. Up to that point, I had a pretty good life. I was a bit of a hell raiser and the problems that I had had up to that point were really direct ramifications of my own rebellion as a child. But at the point I turned 15, I was given over to the custody of a state home. And in the state of Florida, this particular state home has since been shut down because of the heinous treatment of young men like myself that were there. It was basically a facility for extreme troubled youth. I was with murderers and rapists that were up to 20, sometimes older, that had been sentenced as juveniles. So there was plenty of 17, 18, 19, 20 year old guys in here. And as a 15 year old young man, it really hit me hard. The predator mentality of the guys that were in there was fierce. So I learned very quickly what evil looks like in the world. Further still, the guards were very sick very, very sick men. And they did a lot of things to the young men that was very inappropriate. I was blessed to not have been sexually molested. There was an incident where some guys tried to get to that point, And luckily, I fought for my life. I fought like the third monkey getting on Noah's Ark at that point. And it was a pouring down rain. But that kind of led me towards realizing a lot of things and how to deal with people. And really, the understanding of the evil in the world that I have today helps so much now, nothing really shocks me. The, the evil that people are capable of doesn't really shock me. When I saw these guys that were, you know, ex-NFL, ex-NBA players, huge, you know, men torturing these young boys, in certain ways of, you know, putting them in five point positions and standing on their head. One guy would wear cowboy boots and use the toe of his boot to do different pressure point stuff. And they would five point position for those of you who don't know is they would have a guy on the head and the guy on each limb and they would be doing joint manipulation and, and just these kids would be screaming and they'd be twisting them up. They'd call them put it, they'd call it putting them in pretzels and all kinds of different names that they had for it. And basically these were bad kids. Some of these kids were crazy. Some of them would flip like that, lose their minds and go crazy. And there was these concrete boxes and that's really all they were, solid concrete boxes with a little skylight at the top so some sunlight could come in but just concrete boxes and they would put the kids in these boxes when they were bad or when they were had some sort of an altercation 
and they would do they would do these five point positions. They'd go in and 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 twist them up and stand on them and and do pressure points. And you'd hear the kids screaming from the cells. And I've been in that cell probably as many times as anybody else because I was still rebellious when I was in there and uh, had my fair share of of being put in a pretzel and and stood on and kicked and and you know they would do anything they could do that aside from actually striking you really because they didn't want to leave bruises. But this place has been shut down now uh, because of all of this. But just to tell you, you know, some of the post-traumatic stress that I dealt with, that changed me. And that and jail time and prison time and then my run-ins with the government having to deal with that changed me. And I think that what really gave me the most traumatic stress in my life and when I really had stereotypical PTSD I mean after I thought that after all that stuff that I could deal with anything but for me it got a whole lot worse than that it really got bad and I actually had some serious stress issues and post-traumatic stress and dealing with stress issues and it, it mainly evolved around a time in my life where a lot of you guys know I was hunted as an international fugitive for a few years and there was some false falsified warrants put out for my arrest and there was a falsified Interpol red notice I was put in prison in Germany um, I was in El Salvador I had I was tortured in various nations I was in Spain incarcerated in Spain El Salvador Germany okay all illegal and you know when you think you have freedom and you think that the United States government well here's the Constitution they at least have to do this they at least have to give me a chance to speak my mind they I at least have to get a fair trial you think those things right we all do we all think those things but when you really start to realize the truth that you have no rights and that you have no chance and that you have no freedom and you know you start to see that you know hey maybe i'm they're either going to kill me or keep me in this i was in a prison in germany with no outside contact okay in a in a not even allowed to leave the cell i was in and you know terrible conditions freezing cold with very limited clothing and, and it was just it was just very, it was a rough time El Salvador was worse because they 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 basically pulled the stops and and just full on full on interrogation uh you know full on El Salvador was a full on what you would even think about in a movie style interrogation so you know previously to this I had gone from airport I I travel all the time you guys know I travel the world regularly my business previously to this working as a international private security contractor and consultant I was called to go all around the world and I've been in hundreds of flights and just un innumerable amount of countries and when I started getting arrested and put in holding cells underneath the airport and then interrogated and tortured and then put in foreign prisons every time I flew this started doing it was wearing me down and, and I thought I was tough but it was wearing me down and wearing me down and wearing me down. And it really got to the point where when I, by the time I got done dealing with all that, it took me two years and hundreds of thousands of dollars in attorney's fees and lawyers just to get my freedom back. And I'll never get the government to admit that they did me wrong. I'll never get any kind of re reimbursement for my money or any kind of an apology. I don't think, I mean, I'm hoping for a pardon. If you guys are big time fans, I will ask that you forward this video on over or any of my videos on over to any anybody in the United States government or anybody that has a big following so I can try and get my story out there. But anyway, let's continue on talking about PTSD and helping people. Again, this is difficult for me to talk about, guys. So I've never shared this aspect of my emotional journey and it's even hard. It's hard to talk about. So, and I've, I've gotten past, I've gotten over the worst of it, but it got to the point where I was having panic attacks and I, and I hate to admit that. And I was dealing with my panic attacks, but even after I got my freedom back, I immediately went to the airport again. I was, 
I had overseas assets that I had to go back to other countries and, and get my assets and figure out what was going on. I've been in prison, guys. Everybody thought I was dead. And now I got out of prison. I have vehicles. I have houses. I have all kinds of shops and equipment and machinery and employees and, and you know money in the bank that everybody thinks you're dead. What happens to all this stuff? So now I have to go fly out of the country. Well, immediately, a few days after getting out of being transferred from Germany to the United States, once I got back to the United States, finally... Finally, they, they, the, the United States came to get me in Germany after basically they realized there was kind of just no way that they could make this false, these false charges stick. And within a few days, I was just, I was free. I was on the streets again. And it was like mind blowing to be basically thought to be dead and completely your family thinks you're dead. Your government has abandoned you and stuck you in a black site prison in Germany like you don't exist under a false charge, under a different name, all this crazy stuff. And it's like, then it goes back to you're on the streets again. And it's like, of course I had some, you know, I was being watched very closely, but I was, I was free, you know, I was free, a free man. And it was like, what the heck? So adjustment there was a little bit rough. And then immediately when I went to, I went to the airport, went to fly back to immediately at this point, my Latin American facility. And I'm sitting there at the airport and this is after I had been arrested and tortured and arrested and arrested and arrested and put in prison at like many different airports, many, many different airports. I'm sitting there and here comes the SWAT team and the U.S. Marshals. After I had just been released and cleared of everything, okay, cleared of everything, here comes SWAT team and U.S. Marshals storming the gate that I'm sitting and I'm sitting there and they, all of these guns in my face and I'm like, okay. Uh, I just, I, at that point I, I was, it was so hard to deal with that because it's like, I had to, and I had to reach out to God, my higher power. And I, and that, they put me in a, in a cell and there was a terrorist, sus suspected terrorist next to me doing, praying to Mecca underneath the Atlanta airport in the, in the prison cells they have underneath the Atlanta airport. And here I am and I'm praying. And I just said, he's praying to Mecca. I'm praying to, to the whole one true God. And I said, you know, I said, God, please, I can't do this on my own, obviously. As tough as I might be, as much as I've been through, my only strength comes from the Lord. And, and I broke down. I wouldn't say I broke down. I was just, I've since this whole, throughout this whole thing, my strength had been coming from God. Uh, that's, that's the real way that, that's, that's how I found my strength. And you got to find your strength your own way. But I prayed and I prayed and I prayed. And these guys just wanted to mess with me. So they held me up until the point that my flight left. And then once my flight left, they told me. And these guys' names, the names of these guys that did this is in my, one of them is Officer Arnsdorf. I forget the other one. But it's in the bio that I had written up on my website, okay? That bio was a simple compilation of facts with cited References to all the people's input, all the lawyers, it's just a compilation of facts, case numbers, officers' names who did this, okay? This is undisputable that the, these are facts that I'm sharing with you guys. But these guys held me long enough to make me miss my flight, and then they let me go and they said, oh, sorry. But the, the, the damage done to my brain, imagine, imagine every time you go to the airport, you're arrested and, and put in prison every single time for a day, maybe tortured in El Salvador. Maybe it's in Atlanta. You're just there for the day until you miss your flight and then they let you go. And you're like, I just spent a thousand dollars on tickets and they're gone. You know, what, what do you do at that point? Now I'm here in Atlanta and I don't have, I don't live in Atlanta. I got to get a hotel. I got to buy tickets last minute now. You know, whatever. And, and just imagine the, the, that. Okay, so now... The worst PTSD I ever had, it wasn't from being tortured. It wasn't from being beat up. It wasn't from multiple assassination attempts. Okay. It wasn't from people shooting at me. It wasn't from people trying to kill me. It was from me literally going into an airport and every time back to back to back SWAT team, police, military, prison. Every time for no reason with, with me having done nothing against or and 100% illegal in every country that I've been in, they did this to me. So it's like, at what point 
do you you have no control over that so for me it was losing control and like i said i the only reason that i made it through this is because is a god thing because the government was doing everything they did from the beginning illegally 100% illegal what they did with no problems They had no problem doing it. Their illegal activities, it's very easy for them to do. They had judges sign warrants that were 100% fake. They had warrants go out. They had U.S. Marshals, international military units from several other countries carrying out these, these operations for the U.S. government. All they got to do is sign a piece of paper with no evidence, with no backing, with no nothing. So it's very easy for them to do this, obviously, because they did it. So why am I still here? Why am I still around? Why did they not make me disappear when they wanted to make me disappear? The only thing I can say is God and my faith because when I was in that German prison and nobody knew where I was, nobody knew, everybody thought I was dead. The US government was not admitting that they had done this joint operation to arrest me and put me in prison there and hold me in this black site prison, guys. I mean, there's no record of me whatsoever. Nobody knows where I'm at. My family, my friends, my government contacts even had called the embassy and the embassy said, he's not in Germany. We have no idea what's going on. Bold face lied to him. The embassy knew I was there and they had it classified information. Do not release the information of this guy. Super illegal. Okay. But they did it. Real, what really stuck with me, and this is crazy, but what really stuck with me was a Bible verse where Jesus talks about if you have the faith of a mustard seed, you can move mountains, but it has to be pure, undoubting faith. And I really got into delving into what is faith? What is faith? And I, it took me 48 days in that German prison of wrestling with my faith to completely believe that God would get me out of that situation 100%, 100%. I had to believe that 100% God could get me out of that situation, even though it was physically impossible in this world. The world's strongest government was hiding me under a rock. I had no recourse whatsoever, but I was fighting with having the faith. I had to have 100% faith that God would get me out of that situation. And at the moment I did, when I, pr I prayed daily, read my Bible daily, okay, that there's a video on my German prison stories here. It's very interesting. Very, I can tell you all about my time in Germany in the prison there. If you want to see that video, it's here too. But, uh, it's, you know, it was cool because when my, when I finally, there was that little bit of doubt, like maybe I'm going to stay in prison. Maybe this is just too big of a situation. Maybe. I've done too much wrong in my life and God has abandoned me. You know, whatever, that tiny, you know, 0.2% doubt had to be gone. And when that doubt was gone completely, like that, I entered, I appeared in the system. Oh, now he's in Germany awaiting U.S. Marshal transfer. The U.S. Marshals came, they transferred me back to the United States and boom, everything fell apart for the U.S. government. You know... I thank God and I continued on, but the, 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 the stress and the PTSD hit me at the airports now. And what did I have to do to get over this? I'll tell you what I had to do. I went from there and you can watch all these videos too. I went and traveled like 30 countries after that. I flew out of Israel, Italy, Honduras, Every, you know, just airport, 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 airport. And every time I went into an airport from that time, I was, it was hard. I'll tell you, it was hard because every time I'd walked in an airport, I had been taken with a bunch of men with rifles. I, I can't have any kind of a weapon. All these guys with heavily trained guys with rifles. What are you going to do in that situation? I mean, at a certain point, that makes you feel powerless. It doesn't matter who you are, how much training you have, how much of a badass you are. You've got every different nation's elite special forces teams picking you up and putting you in prison cells every airport you go to. So now I'm going to airports and the stress was just unbelievable. It, you know, I, I was, I was 
what you would, I was not having a full on panic attack, but it was, you know, the closest I've ever been of, of just having that heart rate and heightened senses and all that stuff. And a lot of the stuff that people deal with, with PTSD. Now let's talk about how I deal with it. I just dealt with it, man. I knew that airports were my trigger. So I just went to airport after airport, after airport, after airport, after airport, after airport, and they still bother me. But it was a little tiny, tiny, tiny bit less every time. My palms were sweaty. It got to the point the first two or three times where I couldn't even apply my gray man theory. I was so stressed. My, I, when I came back into the United States a few times, I had cotton mouth. I couldn't talk to the, to the customs officer. And they, because they said, look how nervous this guy is. They, they took me down for questioning a few times. So that didn't help, obviously. But then finally, when they released me from questioning, I was like, it was like, oh, unbelievable. What's going on? I've been released from questioning. They're not going to keep me in prison. They're not going to torture me. They're not going to. So then a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, it got easier. So I just kept going. And that was first few times where I walk up to talk to the. You know, at any point where I had to deal with a security person in airports, the first couple times, yeah, it was tough. I, I, I could almost not talk. My throat's closed up. I, my, my, my body, I was sweating. Okay, why? Was I doing anything illegal? No, but I thought that they were going to do something terrible to me again because it happened time after time after time after time. So the only way to do it, go through it was to go through it. So it's tough, guys. It sucks. You got to put yourself in those situations. That's my recommendation to you guys dealing with PTSD. Put yourself in those situations. So the guys that I know, the, the, the president of Warrior Adventures Inc., very, very good friend of mine, a retired master sergeant from the Army. He was uh, on Christmas Eve. He was blown up in a Humvee. He lost a lot of guys over there. and But that blowing him up, when he got blown up in the Humvee, he had a really bad traumatic, traumatic brain injury, TBI. And... I think PTSD is one thing, guys, but when you also include it with physical brain damage along with the mental brain damage, he suffers very, very, very bad for with PTSD. And, and he he laid his he put his he get dedicated his entire life, retired master sergeant, you know, the highest non commissioned officer rank you can get. Very good friend of mine, one of my best friends. He was the guy that we did the outreach stuff with. And, and the stuff that helps those kind of guys is just socialization, having a friend network. And then when you actually have a physical injury to your brain with it, you pretty much need somebody there if it gets to the point where you where you lose control. So I was blessed to be able to be with him a lot of times. And there were some times when, when things got bad and, and, and you need a good, strong friend to help you with stuff like that. So... He's also been hospitalized and he's had to be hospitalized several times, even recently. Um, he's, you know, tried a lot of experimental therapies recently and stuff too, but he, he's a, it's, he's a great guy. But I think should he put himself in, my first advice was to just throw yourself in that situation until you can deal with it. Should he, who's one of the worst PTSD guys I've come across and one of the greatest guys put himself in that situation? of throwing himself alone into those situations where 4th of July fireworks are going off. Um, that's probably the biggest trigger I've seen from him. Or sometimes on lack of sleep, his physical injury will implement itself through hallucinations and stuff like that. <clears throat> Should he put himself through lack of sleep, sleep deprivation, treatment on his own? Should he put himself through, should he just go to a huge party on 4th of July? with fireworks by himself? No, 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 no. We got to be smart, guys. You need somebody there with you. And if you can't have somebody there with you, unfortunately, I think that you should, uh, you might have to do some sort of an inpatient therapy. Uh, but I think desensitization therapy is the best way to do it. I don't think drugs are good if they're drugs that just are dumbing down or hiding the, the effects of the PTSD. But something else good, like, is what we were doing, what we were doing with helping these guys is taking them hunting, fishing, overland expedition. Mother Nature has a huge healing presence. And if you get good, strong men like myself who were willing to help other men that are strong men, if, if they go, if they, if they, you know, if they're hallucinating or something like that, you need a strong man around to be there to support that person. So those hunting trips, those were invaluable for those guys. And what's absolutely disgusting is that 
what the U.S. government did through all of these, uh, through shutting me down, through raiding my facility, through torturing me, putting me in foreign prisons, is they sh they they shut my. Essentially, we had to shut down Warrior Adventures Inc. Now. I really want to start doing it again. I really want to start. I'm not going to be able to open Warrior Adventures Inc. again because I, after just getting, after what happened with them even targeting that business, it, I'm not going to open it as a business. I'm just going to use my own, my own dollars to to help guys like that, and and that's just what I do. And I'm not gonna I'm not gonna talk about it uh, all the time, and I'm not gonna sh toot my own horn. But that is the way to do it. It's to it's mother nature. It's getting these guys out hunting, fishing. It's finding other strong men because I think a lot of people will ask this question. I'll close this out with the very sad story of Chris Kyle, who was kind of basically doing exactly what I was doing. He was taking the guys to the shooting range instead of taking them out hunting and fishing. I think, I don't necessarily think, I don't think the shooting range is the best idea for right away. I think it's better hunting. Uh, because hunting, you might have one or two shots going off. And then a lot of what the hunting we were doing was bow hunting. So back to the fireworks trigger, you don't, you just don't want somebody having, you don't want that switch to be flipped, but that is why you need strong men around because if something does happen, uh, you, you know, you need to be able to handle the situation. Uh, so so yeah, so as far as PTSD goes, that's what we need to do, guys. We need good, strong men to be taking these men who have stress, women as well, who have who are stressed, good, strong women to, to be helping the other women. Uh, I think it's important that we don't mix the sexes with it just because, so there's no kind of romanticism involved. And I think it's important that we don't have situations like taking these guys shooting all the time with, you know, high capacity magazines and stuff like that right away necessarily. I think it's better if we're dealing with bow hunting first, maybe work into a bolt action firearm. The second amendment is the second amendment. Any gun law is an infringement. So taking guns away from these guys like the government is doing is also a violation of their constitutional rights, just as it is for the government to take my rights away because I was wrongly convicted of a felony. Even if I was convicted of a felony, our founding fathers were all felons. Okay, if you want to get if you want to get right down to the to the point and talk realistically here about the truth. But this is a long video, guys. So I guess I'll close it out here. Questions and comments below. Let me know your thoughts on this. This was uh, tough for me to talk about, but I really hope that this helps, guys. And we all have some sort of stress. And stress is what post-traumatic stress disorder is all about. It's about stress from our past affecting our present or potentially future. So in order to not let that stress affect our present or potentially our future, we need to deal with it. And I've really outlined here some of the best ways that you can deal with it. I think Mother Nature, getting out there, support group. If you're a man, you need a strong man there with you when you're reliving these stresses. I think you need to relive the stresses. And if you are a woman, you need a strong woman there with you to relive these stresses. So relive them. If you need to talk about them, then relive them through talking about them around a campfire. Okay, have a, have a, have a couple iced tea, lemonades, sit around a campfire after a long day of hiking, backpacking, and, and talk about the worst things that have happened to you in your life and, and have somebody strong there that can, that can be there for you. So that's the best way to deal with post-traumatic stress. It's not medications it's not drugs i really appreciate you guys tuning in and i and with your support i can continue to help others i can i can restart taking some of these guys with ptsd i can start again taking them out into the wilderness and i can't do that without your support i'm not at the point where i can do it yet i lost everything through through what happened to me and i'm rebuilding i'm rebuilding and and through any, any way that you support Bone Tactical, you're supporting making the world a better place. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. Bone out.